one of the, as I say, one of the nice things about working with Tom is he expands my horizon. And I try and think a little larger because I, I tend to be very both pragmatic and do what comes in the door. I, um, I don't plan very well. And perhaps from my psychedelic experiences, I've figured out I don't run much of the universe. But the universe is actually running. <laughs> and so if I just put in a kind of notion that I'm available, you know, the, a job comes out of the slot. And so that's how I got into, into microdosing. And I was thinking of, of what it was a sample of and what we are doing that's important. And it's a different version than what we talk in politics about, quote, grassroots. But I want to talk about and then have a case study of, of citizen science. And citizen science is research formal and informal that invites the general population to be participants and observers, data collectors, compilers, analysis, funders, promoters, publicists. It's, it's kind of breaking out of the academic wall. And it turns out to be incredibly important. And it exists because science, way before the word even was around, it's a way of determining what can be known from, if you think about it, from the you know, movements of a single atom where we had some discussion of a single neuron this morning um, to all this wonderful stuff about um, that we're, we're finding out the universe is older. I know I wasn't worried, <laughs> but it's lovely that science kind of takes you in every direction. And citizen science is a way... Um, of becoming part of the process of discovery. And we are inherently kind of biologically curious animals. It's a need. And you see it in some of the monkey research where monkeys will just try and find out what else, is, what else there is available in its environment and people are pretty much the same way. And so when you begin to channel that, you begin to have a very powerful force of discovery and of learning. And the wonderful thing about science, and I'm among the people that, that says bad things about it too, but eventually it's self-correcting. Replication, verification, third-party observations, peer review, all of those we can say both positive and negative things, but as a group, as a notion, it, it beats dogmatism. And of course, we're in a peculiar cultural um, trough at the moment of, of, of a kind of anti-science movement. You know, all those people with big heads that went to more school than I did must be bad people kind of notion. But that doesn't really stop science. It may stop scientists for a while. And when you begin to look at how it's self-correcting, there's a movement in medicine and very, very um, carnitardily or without liking it at all in psychology called replication. And for instance, there was a, a whole group of studies over a few years with lots of institutions where they took a hundred of the most cited psychology experiments, the ones that have the most credibility in the culture, and they replicated them. Well, not all of them. In fact, the replication rate was 38%. Those are the best, most highly regarded studies. Okay? In medicine, where they're also doing it, the numbers are worse. Okay? Because the system is set up so that original research is rewarded, replication not. There's no money, no grants etc. Now we're not talking about the hidden research in pharmaceutical companies where they can cherry pick the results they want to submit and that's true. But it, it raises the question of quote science but it really supports citizen science. It says if you don't think something makes sense 
from your point of view, that's worth checking. And you said, and because there's there's this kind of dodge which is used by politicians as if it makes any sense. Have you ever heard the "I'm not a scientist, but"? Now, they never say, "I'm not. I don't know anything about Iraq, but." Or I'm not an economist, but, or I don't know anything about healthcare, but, but they do say it about science. Okay, so in a funny way, science is is got a different different cachet. And I was trying to think of some successful, important citizen science, meaning it leads to policy, money, laws, and one of my favorite citizen science is bird counts. Now, I don't know if any of you are birders. If you are. You're kind of strange beings in my world because you will get up earlier than I will <laughs> in places I would never go to and get hysterically excited when you can see the difference between two behind feathers of birds. But what, you w <laughs> but what birders do is they do this worldwide ecological analysis and, and counting every year that allows a huge amount of other policy and science to happen. It's a very important piece of, of not biology, but of climatology and, and irrigation and, and deforestation and uh, you know dozens of other activities. And there are also um, just, if you really are in the news business and you're just counting up arrests and break-ins and just you know, crime statistics usually come from citizens. And we all know that that has certain uses for public policy. There's also massive computational studies where you agree to have your computer seized <laughs> and used as one little knob of computation for these massive data analyses. Um, now also criminals can take your computer and do their own analysis. But if you're doing things like weather patterns, gene combinations, mapping the brain, citizen science is, is out there, making it possible in a way that was not really ever true before. And, in, and, and, and then the other part is discovery. Um, if you go through astronomy, um, if you find a comet as an amateur, you know, you get to name it. And there's a huge amount of astronomical data that has been done by amateurs. And, in, and until about a century ago, science was done by amateurs. People who had a, a little, had some financial support, but could take time. Um, it wasn't owned by the academy. And of course, what we're seeing getting a little closer to home is the rise of ethnobotany. Um, and of course, um, I don't know what we call it, renegade chemistry, <laughs> which is, you know, it's like w I, I went to school far enough back, so in high school, the atom had a neutron, an electron, and a proton, and you could understand it. Now there's 21 or 23 particles, and we know that's not enough. Um, ethnobotany says there's a whole lot of things out there that if you eat, chew, smoke, shoot, rub, strange things happen. And citizen science um, is who brings that stuff forward. I mean, who would thought if you take the venom of a toad? Ah, some of you have taken that. <laughs> I was thinking of the other one where you burn it on. And I thought, that takes a lot of citizen <laughs> science before you come up with that one. <laughs> what do you do with this venom? How about burn it? Oh, sure. How about onto your skin? Oh, sure. <laughs> Whoa. <laughs> Thanks for sharing. And citizen botany, cannabis. Cannabis is the most researched plant in the world. And the one with the most varieties and sub-varieties and pairings and matchings. Um, almost all of it, not only citizen science, but citizen science under duress. Imagine it's all, most of it was underground citizen science. And the world has changed because of that. Now, 
I just want to give you just this is total gossip. This is what I, in my notes it says, if you have a little moment. Um, the company that put up five hundred thousand dollars against the Arizona marijuana bill it was the only bill that failed, and they put up five hundred thousand dollars, which in Arizona is a lot, and they put it up very near the end of the campaign. That company made one product, fentanyl. And that company just got a patent from the federal government for a synthetic or a derivative of some sort of marijuana. Okay? That's not citizen science. <laughs> okay, but you can see how. One of they basically were saying we would like people to either have our product or nothing rather than our product or what you grow in your front yard. So, as I say, that's just a little note. It was so ugly I couldn't bear not sharing it. But if you think of some other individual uses of citizen science, um, one of the first medical uses for marijuana was after chemotherapy. Right, it was how to give yourself the munchies. And at one point in California, I remember there was a, that like 60 to 70 percent of oncologists said, "Yes, I would recommend it if I could." To my clients, now of course they can. But that led to that first use of medical marijuana. Really, now there's been a cascade of medical applications. And, and being verified in scientific labs, mostly outside the U.S., but first discovered and promoted by citizen science. And Irwid, who is one of the, you know, earth and, uh, the, the earth and fire, just like enormous heroes in my pantheon, um, what have they done? They've set up a worldwide testing, tasting, and reporting network. And I... I use it, and police use it, and hospitals use it, and poison centers use it, you know, because I get letters that say, can you do such and such with such and such? And I think, what is it? <laughs> and then you find out, here's how to overdose with this, and how sick I got with that, and this was a trip, but then I mixed it with that. There is more research on the Irwood thing than could ever be imagined in any other way, let alone blue light and other places that you go. So I want to now give you a case in point of citizen science, which is microdosing. And just to be sure, now I didn't ask this this morning, but how many of you have microdosed? Okay, well, the, would the couple of people who didn't raise their hand talk to somebody? <laughs> <laughs> how many of you have sent in reports so I can make this into science? Yeah, that's what I thought. J. Fadiman, one word, at Gmail, tell me what you've done, and we will, I will turn it into both media gossip, which I'm at, I'm, I'm getting better at, and my partner and I will turn it into, into data. We are exploring the space, just as the marijuana people are exploring the space, and, you know, believe me, in the 60s, People did not say, hey, you can use pot for seizures for children. Okay, just wasn't our <laughs> where we were. So you may participate in citizen science or you can hoard your information, and that's not a good idea. So how did how did how did I get into this this strange microdose? I've spent my whole career being really interested in high dose transcendent leave the planet and the universe, aware that you've never born and will never die, those kind of s sessions. And here I am down at the other end of the line with saying, well, maybe you could drop from 10 to 8 micrograms, <laughs> and that might help. Well, as many of you know, my early history was with Richard Alpert, who said, the greatest thing in the world has happened to me, and I want to share it with you. And that took care of my career. And 
I mean, that's a very short biography, right? <laughs> and, and as I mentioned this morning with the creativity study, uh, the federal government said, we'd like you to have a, another career change now that you've got your PhD with one of the only PhDs in psychedelic studies at that time. And don't worry, you won't publish. <laughs> um, Robert Fort, F-O-R-T-E, one of the, again, rather unsung and not as well-known heroes of the psychedelic world, um, told me that Hoffman had told him about microdosing and that he was interested in, in doing it at, at a particular time in his life with the relationship he was in. And it seemed to me like, who would want to bother with 10 micrograms when you can, you know, take 400 and see God or love God or be God, depending on your religious belief. However, I got interested and I started asking people about it and how they were using it and what happened. And then I got into, I'm discovering something. Whoa. You know, th you know that feeling you sometimes get on a psychedelic that you're really special? <laughs> right? It's just before you get that you're everybody. <laughs> 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 and, and some of us, you know, didn't go that last place and we set up little cults and, you know, and so forth. So I was into that. <laughs> this is all that I've prepared for and it's my stuff and nobody much knows. And then I talked to an anthropologist and he said, has it ever occurred to you that indigenous people would have tried microdosing? over the thousands of years they've used psychedelics? Oh, maybe, <laughs> little. <laughs> and then he indicated that um, not only was that obviously true, and he gave me a reference to look up, and then he also indicated that he personally, whenever he felt a cold coming on, would take a little pinch of, of psychedelic mushroom, and he hadn't had a cold in 15 years. so. Big Pharma, are you listening? <laughs> so, and we haven't we haven't explored that one. But um, the Spanish source that he gave me was a six-volume work written just after the conquest, and it was a guy who went and worked with indigenous with 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 priests and healers and a lot of people and tried to re tried to record the knowledge. This was a, a Catholic priest, um, so. Microdosing is all over it. So yes, the Aztecs knew and the people in Peru knew and so forth. So psychedelics have been used as a microdose very, 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 very long time. And I was, um, earlier I had been in New York and I'd given a speech and I'd complained about the government. Very, very risky to do. And I'd said, since psychedelics had been stopped, this was before, quote, this renaissance that brings us all here, I said, they might not have researched psychedelics, but 25 million Americans had taken LSD. They could ask them questions. And then I thought, I could ask them questions. <laughs> and I thought, whoa, that's an idea. <laughs> then I wouldn't be able to complain. And that was a very mixed moment, of course. <laughs> you know that one. So that's how I started asking questions. And I would do what Tom did this morning, is he handed out a form. And so I gave a lot of talks and I'd hand out forms and I began to find out what the use patterns were in, uh, and I can tell you the use pattern differences between Yale and UC Santa Cruz, which you already know, so I don't need to share you that. <laughs> but I have data. <laughs> So I was into asking questions. And as I learned about asking questions, I got into microdosing. And at the moment, microdosing is probably um, the most reported on psychedelic issue. Not perhaps most important, but kind of in. And not only reporting, but people being interested. Um, Last week, there was a 15-minute segment on the BBC, not the main program, but one of the other programs. And it basically showed three not very exciting people, a housewife, 
with two kids in the country, a writer, and a person who'd been diagnosed with a number of mental conditions. They were all microdosing and successfully in their different ways. That was a ni- that was nice piece of reporting about kind of what people are doing these days. What was interesting is in the first, and uh, then it was a little teeny news item on kind of BBC News, you know, a little online item. And then it, it directed you to the, to, the, to the video. The online item had 930,000 hits in the first day, which says people at least opened it to read the story. So it's of general interest. And that isn't as true of some of the other, many of the other interesting things we're going to see this weekend. So what I really just want to do, because I'm going to give a fairly um, tougher data-filled presentation tomorrow, and I thought I could just cheat and get two presentations for one, and then God said to me, who are you cheating? And I said, okay. So this is different than tomorrow. (laughs) But I just want to give you what I've been working with, and rather than numbers and statistical work and so forth, because we've got a, a, a huge sample since I, since I added somebody smart and who knew how to do, use data to my um, putting reports in a box method of science. So I'm just going to read you quotes about various ways in which microdosing is of interest. And that's all we're going to do. So this is uh, this is this says general, and this is a quote from um, from Marilyn. Subdoses allow me to increase my focus, open my heart, and achieve breakthrough results while remaining integrated with my routine. I would venture to say that my wit, response time, and visual and mental acuity seem greater than normal on it. 10 years experience, okay? She said, I didn't use it when I was pregnant, and I missed it. But that's, but that's the level of, you know, upset. Hmm? Am I just talking about LSD? Is that the question? No, I'm actually talking about LSD, psilocybin, that's about maybe 85% of our of, of a sample of over 1,000. But I'm also talking about 1P LSD. I'm talking about ALD52. I'm talking about actual psilocybin, which is very, very rare. I'm talking about mescaline, peyote, or... Uh, I'm not talking probably very, very little about uh, ayahuasca and ibogaine. They're slightly different. They're kind of different stations on the, on the radio dial. And we don't have much information. But I do know that there's some microdosing deliberately in Ibogaine clinics and some other places. So, but this is, this is when I say psychedelics, it's that little classic group um, plus these outliers of, of, of research chemicals. I first experimented with microdosing last summer for a period of two weeks. I realized after documenting my results with a daily journal that almost every aspect of my life had improved during that time. I felt as if the paradigm had shifted and I was empowered with a new perspective and operating mode. Okay? This is general. During the course of the month, I sense there's been a cumulative effect. Gradually, I felt more loving and connected with others. This is uh, a spiritual teacher, by the way. Uh, My teaching and group facilitation seems to have improved with more boldness, more wisdom, and more empathy apparent. I feel a bit more creative, though this has not manifested in my getting started on the writing projects I was hoping to do. Okay? And basically, that's a report from a spiritual teacher uh, whose name you would know. For me... 16 mics has proven to help me to be more creative, self-conscious, loving, clearly focused, and overall positive and optimistic. I do not feel I'm on a psychedelic at this dose, nor do I feel high or get any sensory hallucinations. Now, 15 is a little high. But this dose can make stressful situations more stressful. 
and it's relieved some of my anxiety. I felt like a more fine-tuned version of myself lately, even when it's been three days since my last dose. And the last general one, the experiences of increased flow, joy, gratitude, decreased anxiety, and increased concentration. I have sometimes felt more volatile in temperament, more anxious, and have had difficulties performing work tasks that I don't enjoy. See, one of the things that happens in your life, and think about it, how you're leaving a job, finally, that you haven't liked, and how much more awful the job is when you know you're going to leave it. You know that? So, a um, number of you are in the educational world. Let's see, I have some comments from students. College is going great, and microdosing has allowed me to become deeply aware of myself and my goals in life. I've been observing and taking note of the changes in mood, creativity, and cognition. This is a college freshman. In microdosing, I find I'm more engaged than ever in my schoolwork. My motivation has skyrocketed, and I feel a greater sense of purpose and direction in doing seemingly menial tasks. I no longer feel lethargic and tired in my classes, and I'm able to retain my professor's speeches better than ever before. It's as though I can replay previous statements and write them in their entirety while simultaneously retraining the words they are currently speaking, if this makes any sense. I can look at a PowerPoint slide once or twice and remember it its entirety without needing to glance back and forth between my notes and the slide. My first semester in college was a breeze thanks to microdosing. I did great on my finals, etc. And I got a letter from someone from an Ivy League college who said that he had used microdosing. Um, he, had, he said, I took the hardest available math course available to undergraduates. And I feel that microdosing made it really easy. I wrote him back and said, more information. He said, a lot of my friends are using it for different subjects. <laughs> and I said, please get back to me. And that was the last I heard of him. So, <laughs> But he's good in math. This is someone who had dropped out of college and went back. I'm currently taking general chem 2 and linguistics. I've continued microdosing and have seen a remarkable improvement in my overall mood cognition, arithmetic abilities, which aren't too good, memory and energy levels. The effects are still noticeable even when I'm not dosing. So that feels like we might expect from using some substance that's good for you. Okay, this is a kind of psychological improvements that we've heard about. Um, there's a study that was done at Hopkins on smoking. You know the, s the study? Basically 12 people. To get into it, you had to be smoking like two packs a day for 20 years and had tried a lot of things. And they had a very high success rate with two therapy sessions, I mean two full day sessions of, of psilocybin and a lot of intermediate therapy. I'm 26 years old and I was smoking a pack a day I live in New Jersey, so my cigarettes were nine fifty a pack, costing me $3,500 a year. He microdosed about four times and stopped smoking. And when I came across him and he told me that, I said, well, how long ago was that? He said, about eight months. I said, have you smoked since? He said, no, as in, why would you ask me? I don't smoke. Okay? And what he said is, it's as if his body... You're actually, your body doesn't like cigarette smoking. I don't know if you've noticed that. But <laughs> and he said it's like his body had more votes. Mushrooms have also helped me quit smoking. Well, butrin helped, but just killed the physical craving. Taking mushrooms made smoking seem irrelevant and a waste of time. <coughs> also, the last time I smoked a cigarette, I vomited up my entire dinner. It felt like my body just said no. <laughs> it actually sounded and <laughs> looked like it too. Okay? 
So that's that's parallel to that other smoker. And um, she had some other nice things, but just let me just put out quietly as a possibility. My periods were normal for the first time. Okay. That's just one to ponder. Stuttering. Although there was an increase in stuttering during the reading, this was an experiment that he was running. He, was, he would read something and mark all the stuttered places. I experienced perfect fluency while talking to my coworkers shortly after I did this reading. I experi this is another quote. I experienced near perfect fluency while talking the entire rest of the day after taking the microdose. When talking to a friend and his sister, along with perfect fluency, I felt that I was in control of the conversation and making eye contact the entire time. <coughs> Stutterers don't like to make eye contact because they don't like your reaction as they're fumbling for a word. And they can't be fluent because they are pre-editing. They're kind of getting a word and they're thinking, uh-uh, that's not a good word for me. I'll pick a different one. So perfect fluency, which is what we would just call talking, um, is, is a, an extraordinary achievement. Um, he's changed his major to do graduate work in speech therapy, and his goal is to be able to do psilocybin therapy with stutterers. Migraines. Anybody here ever had a migraine? Would you like not to have another? In general, nothing of note happened today. The one thing I left out, because I didn't want to tempt fate, this is 30th day of a journal. I suffer from migraines and haven't had any for 30 days. This has happened before, but very rarely over the years. <coughs> Worth looking at. Depression and anxiety. I was interested in the trial, not for depression in the clinical sense, but for feelings of worthlessness that have dogged me since puberty. I'm 52. Lots of negative self-talk that can't be turned off. That was definitely absent today, my first day. Okay? Here's someone who is um, on 100% on disability for mental illness who uses the term, uh, the, uh, the false name of Winter Acorn. He says in, a, in, a, in his six-month report, is it possible LSD could help mental illness? LOL, somebody should check. Because I'm still taking 11 micrograms of LSD <coughs> every other morning for six months. Helps a lot. Feel more connected, energized, empathic doing some deep work healing old wounds near the foundation. Obvious improvements in wellness across the board, per everybody, including my therapist. So this is someone who is, I say, severely disabled, or, and now I get reports from him pretty regularly, he's, um, he's not very disabled anymore. Um, and, he's a, and, he, and he writes beautiful, just beautiful prose. In the last two months, I've become more and more confident in myself and my abilities. A nagging feeling that I might be a fraud has gone away, and confidence has returned with a vengeance, an arrogance, almost. I, my ability to pitch my work and myself went up several levels and even helped me score a consistent client. I'm less afraid and doubtful. A lot of people report that they are using it to come off psychiatric meds, both antidepressants, but more, most obviously, the, the Adderall, Provigil kinds of meds. And the comment from a number of people is, I get all the benefits of my meds with none of the side effects. And what people are complaining about is both the meds don't work and they can't get off them, or they do work and they can't get off them. The pharmaceutical industry may not like this because 
when you can get someone addicted to an antidepressant or to a stimulant for life, it's not bad if you're in the business. Um, ADD. I took approximately 0.2 grams and I was fascinated. For the first time, I was able to both read and write while music and lyrics played in the background. As a teen, I was diagnosed with ADD and the freedom of attention control was an absolute first for me. My concentration was mine to do as I pleased. I felt heartened that I might be onto something. I did not feel high, I felt grounded. Now the other use you're hearing, these have both been kind of illness oriented, but um, it's quote Silicon Valley phenomena, which really means um, intelligent people around the world who are interested in this stuff. It just happened the first reports came out of Silicon Valley because a lot of reporters who like to report on psychedelics live here. This is just a 28-year-old. It helps me think more creatively and stay focused. I manage my stress with ease and I'm able to keep my perspective healthy in a way that I was unable to do before. It's hard to summarize because life has lots of variables. It's my fourth week in. The first two to three weeks were great. I felt significantly more focused and had more space in me for others. I felt like the gears of my brain were lubricated and it was just easier to initiate things and continue working on them and to move on to other things once I was ready. Everything just felt easier. And you may know there's a book out called A Really Good Day by Eilert Waldman. And it's the story of someone who microdosed for a month um, and is a writer and also was able to write a book which had a 50,000 copy first printing about her microdosing. So, and she has a lot of very good material on the drug war because she's actually a um, background as a criminal lawyer and defense attorney and lectures on drug law at Berkeley. And was also very, 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 very hesitant to take a psychedelic because, as she said, when you've been a uh, defense attorney, you really know what paranoia is. Eilert Waldman, it's called A Really Good Day. Um, there are there, one of the questions is, well, how about some negative experiences? You know, there must be something bad, and there is. And here's one that I just liked. I've had a few undesirable effects. I took 10 micrograms and had hot flashes, temperature sensitivity, incoherence, nausea and stomach pains, discontent, and physical discomfort. The letter goes on to say, what do you think I should do? I said, stop. <laughs> he wrote back and he said, oh, I don't know about that. I said, stop. He said, well, are you sure? I said, stop. So he wrote back and said, I lowered the dose and the symptoms went away. Okay, I want to finish with, a, with, a, with a, uh, every once in a while, and you've seen it in medicine, your early ca you get one case that like says this is worth pursuing. This is one person, and I'll tell you a little bit about her after we read about some of her sessions. Remember, I asked people to take it for a month. It's about 10, 10 doses. After an hour, I immediately felt slightly euphoric. Such a nice feeling. I was m motivated to manage things. For example, cleaning my apartment, smile, paying bills, doing some home office work. Also realized my thoughts were more positive than usual. Right now, my life isn't easy, but my inner setting seems surprisingly optimistic. This is a woman in her 30s, um, European. Second cycle, I was experiencing a different mood than usual, meaning I felt, reading regularly, I feel very depressed, anxious, and worried, but with microdose, my mood immediately changed. I felt optimistic about my life. I started to focus on solution challenges rather than problems. It was observing like another me. Somehow, I always believed the way we look at things affects our life, but now it was not a belief. It was a certainty. Fifth cycle. After one hour, I experienced euphoria, maybe a bit stronger. Through all the cycles, I discovered I'm doing sport more regularly. 
Also, I still eat too much, but I don't have any of the horrible binges since I started with microdosing. This is really important because I've struggled a lot regarding bulimia. Now, let me just now step back a moment. Here's her report on who she was. Struggled with depression, anxiety, eating disorder, bulimia, post-traumatic stress, and ADS for 18 years. As she was doing this, she is actually on medical leave from her last position, which was managing um, a fairly large nonprofit. Sixth cycle. This is so inspiring to me. It's like getting deep roots and a new beautiful vision of myself for the journey of life. Also, I'm not so emotional anymore. This is terrific for our relationship. We've had a lot of difficulties and fights in the past because of my struggling with depression and things like that. I always felt I had no skin, so vulnerable. Since I started microdosing, I'm much more calm. My life companion gives me the same positive feedback. Seventh cycle. I sleep much better than before because normally my sleep is light and restless and I, I now sleep without waking up until morning. And in the morning I feel relaxed with a smile on my face. I can't even remember last time I felt so comfortable in my own skin. Eighth cycle. I got my menstruation today, but this time I didn't experience any pain. So great, explanation, explanation, explanation. Because normally I'm really struggling with this. Nine. It's really like having my life finally come back. To me, it seems I'm experiencing a much better version of myself. That's why I'm doing this work. Thank you. So we have a little bit of time for questions. I ran a little bit over. Yes, yes, please. Yeah, yeah. Stand up and talk loud because I have slight hearing loss. Here comes the mic. Oh, and even better. <laughs> Remember, question is a single sentence. Remember that one? <laughs> it's still true. Do you have any uh, data or even just ruminations on microdosing as a prophylactic for uh, old age, uh, avoiding dementia? Um, the Beckley Foundation just recently uh, did an article for a major science magazine in Europe and raised that possibility. Um, as you'll see tomorrow in the, in the formal presentation, our, our group of people from 70 to 80 is not too many. And so the answer is at this point, I don't know. But if, remember that first picture Tom showed today of the two brains? If we're getting more connections, it's worth exploring. See, the fun part of, of citizen science is at some point you say, you people that need the double-blind, randomized, crossover, unbelievably expensive study, it's yours, but Here's some really interesting areas you could go for, and that's certainly one. <laughs> um, it went back there. Once, you, once the mic leaves you, you're kind of in trouble. Okay. This quick question. Uh, what was the modal frequency of dosing every other day, every third day? Is modal frequency how often? <laughs> yeah. Uh, what we recommend, we being Sophia Corb and I, is one day on and two days off. So that's day one on, day two, day three off, day four on. That's, a, that's what we call a cycle. Why did we come to that? Well, we, in, uh, in my years of doing this, have found out that, that psychedelics at the microdose level have a generally a two-day effect. And many, many people say the second day is better. The third day is so that you can come down and see the difference because this is science. This is citizen science. It's self-study. And that seemed to be very sensible. What we found over a cycle, a 10-day, a 10-cycle month, as you heard with this young woman, by the 10th cycle, 
eighth or ninth, tenth cycle, that third day often is fine. Now this is particularly interesting if we're dealing with people, say, who've been uh, seriously depressed, because they really know the difference. So that's, th that's the general. And what we say to people is, this is citizen science, here's what we think works, you do what's right for you. And so people write in and say, it's not working, can I do 15 mics? Or can I do it every day? Or how about taking a major dose once a week too? <laughs> and, you know, and we're trying to answer, because one of the things, as you know, with psychedelics is you can't take them every day. There's something, you're anti-addictive. So that was also part of the reason for spacing. And it seems to have been a pretty good, uh, it, pre it works for people. Uh, y you talked about uh, migraines. Uh, what would you specifically recommend for migraines? Are you talking psilocybin or LSD or? Again, we have found no differences that we can point to between psilocybin and LSD. Now, I should tell you, we did a little test case, which is, um, because Sophia is um, so much more data aware than I am, she invented a little bot, a little, you know, those information bots that, that tell you, you why you don't, you know, that, that torture you on Facebook. She got one that would investigate the difference between reports on Irwid of LSD and psilocybin. And the one thing that it couldn't use in its analysis is the name of the substance. And we found statistically and every other way we could measure that there was no difference in the reports in Irwood of, you know, massive doses between psilocybin and LSD. We have found in the microdose world that we can't distinguish. Now, are there differences? See, the difference, remember, we all know LSD is 12 hours and psilocybin is 8, you know, 5, 6, seven, whatever it is. Um, but that's, a, that's all. When we get to the afterglow, which is what that, which is something we've ignored in the psychedelic world. If you think about it, LSD doesn't take 12 hours. It's 12 hours plus six weeks. Doesn't, those six weeks count. But we were so caught up in the kind of medical model that you know, once, once the flowers stopped talking to you, we thought it was over. But if you really think about it, Think about your own experiences. Think about Hoffman's experience, who the next day says it was like the f seeing his garden was like the first day of creation. Okay, that's the that's the. So it isn't that there. That psychedelics need to be really rethought as a much longer. Okay, so we're getting it a little bit with some of the depression research, where they say, "Wow, we give a big dose for depression." and people don't go back on their meds for six weeks. Well, yeah, that's not surprising for those of us who've been paying attention to the whole experience. So whatever question that was, I hope I answered it, because I know I wandered off somewhere terrible. Oh, no difference. Uh, you mentioned use pattern differences at UC Santa Cruz and Yale. Wait, 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 slow down. Between Santa Cruz and Yale, yes. Yeah, you mentioned use pattern differences. Yes. And um, so I'm kind of curious if you would comment more about that. <laughs> what I asked at both schools was use patterns. Okay, and I had, um, I was told that uh, I would get about 30 people showing up at Yale and there was 125 because Yale doesn't talk about it much or didn't then. Santa Cruz was the biggest lecture hall on campus. Um, Santa Cruz people take a lot more drugs, a lot more often, at every conceivable opportunity. <laughs> <laughs> Yale students tended to take one or two sessions, but many were life-changing. I had a small sample of about 30. A number of career changes, people in finance moved to psychology. <laughs> People in psychology moved to biology. <laughs> and there were two people who had major religious changes. One became very much more religious, and the other became way less religious. Same religion. So I would say that Yale students took it much more seriously. And it was not, they were not um, druggies in the, in the, unkind sense. And Santa Cruz students 
the, the thing with Santa Cruz students was they kind of took every, I, I once asked some of my Santa Cruz friends how they, why they were using such and such, something pretty obscure, and they said it was around. <laughs> but what they had was a shift in use pattern where they started by taking it basically to trip, whatever that meant. They then started taking it more for personal growth and particularly for dealing with things like social anxiety, which if you remember college, high school was worse, but college was still social anxiety. And then, and then uh, after one talk, a woman came up and said, I'm going to give you a new term, <sighs> hikadelic. I said, what's that? She said, four times a year, a group of us get together, we take a low dose of a psychedelic, and we take a hike. <laughs> <laughs> That's Santa Cruz. Yale's more serious. Yes, please. So some of your um, quotes said 11 micrograms and 16 micrograms. Yeah. So really, when we're out in the black market collecting things, how does anybody really know what their microdose is? Well, here's my, my this, is, this is now economics. If I buy a tab, it's not going to have more LSD on it than I'm being sold. <laughs> that's my theory of economics. <laughs> so that's one way of measurement. Uh, these people who are taking 16 or 8 have measured in one way or another. Uh, I get these wonderful letters that say, it's really hard to cut a tab in all these little ways. Is there another way? And I say, yeah, how about dissolving it in water? <laughs> It turns out that if you want to get the safest, best measured, etc., psychedelics, it's called the dark web. And we have now two different dark web dealers who've come to us with research proposals <laughs> that they are funding. And, and, and the first one, a wonderful man who, or, or woman, I don't know, who goes by the name of Hong Kong Post, indicated that he had come up with a wonderful double blind, which is a little complicated, and basically, could we go over the protocol of the questions he wanted to ask? Uh, and someone else wants to do a much larger study, maybe between 1,000 and 2,000. Uh, there's a lot of business on the web. And because each of these dealers has the equivalent of Yelp, they really can't afford to not do a good job. And I've had several people write me and say the dark web is, is really, one of them called it interesting, the democratizing of the world. So that things that are illegal any place in the world you can get on the dark web. So I don't recommend it, I don't not recommend it, and I'm not hip enough to know how to get there. Um, and so the question, however, the question that's important is what feels right? Meaning... The, the awake pill this morning, um, which my wife gave me. You know, I wrote her and said, how do you do this? <laughs> and she said, I take an allergy pill, which makes me sleepy, and that's why I use the, the caffeine. So the people who are using odd numbers are doing that because that worked for them. We found that 10 is about right for most people, but like anything else, nothing is right for all people. And there's a lot of areas, and we're going to finish, there's a lot of areas where we don't recommend microdosing, and the most important, just to think about, is anxiety. When people say, I have depression and anxiety, we say, great. If they say, we have anxiety, we say, we have had not great success. And our theory is that what happens with any psychedelic is you are more aware of your own inner processes. And if your main inner process is anxiety, people report that they're more anxious. And in a sense, when you're doing this kind of, of citizen science, you're really after, when you get the kind of things I've been reading you, you're really after the negatives. You really want to find out, uh, because if it's too good to be true, it's too good to be true. If it's very good for a large percentage of people, that's great, but you really want to help the people who shouldn't as well. And that's a, that's a, you have a, a, probably a greater moral responsibility in that area. 
So we're, as you'll see reporting tomorrow, we have a few places where we say people s in our sample of um, have not done well with in certain conditions. Uh, one more question and then we're going to stop. Yes, please. I would just like to continue on what you said before. Is there any, um, let's say, if microdosing like a cigarette package had a warning sign on it, is there any, I mean, I hear that now anxious people, it may not work, but is there any people that it's just, that you've had really like n negative results, not beyond just that it didn't work? I mean, if people had really terrible results. Yes. No deaths. Remember, there's, no been a, there's never been a death from LSD. 26 million people, just by chance. Mm -hmm. Meaning, you know, like 212 of those people probably have died of lightning. Okay, <laughs> <laughs> so LSD's like off the charts with safe. A tenth of that or a twentieth of that is safer. So we're not expecting, and, and what happens when people have, I mean, this lovely guy, I thought, wow, that amazing amount of negative reactions. You know, I'm so impressed. What's going on? And then he drops the dose and it all goes away, and I don't know what happened. So citizen science gets to a point where you say, you know, I'd like to be able to take a bunch of, say, well, I'd like to really take a group like pre women who have horrible periods and, and do a tight study because it looks like that might be an incredible gift to women. Now, it's not a gift to Motrin, but the other thing is, for instance, cluster headaches, which we didn't discuss. Cluster headaches are alleviated by high doses of psychedelics, and it looks like they may be alleviated by low doses of psychedelics as well, by microdoses. And cluster headaches are the worst pain known to human beings. So there's some incredibly exciting areas that we're looking at, and, and fortunately the cluster people are also doing citizen science. And I think there will be one presentation on the symposia uh, from cluster headaches. And if any of you are seriously interested in that, that's a, an amazing area of interest. Because these are people who... Um, cluster headaches, no painkiller touches it meaning it's a different pathway of pain than any painkiller. So, enough. Thank you. <laughs>